Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, we're very excited to dive in some full data about sleep. I see a lot of people joining, and because we have so much to talk about, we're probably going to go ahead and get started. So I'm just going to go ahead and quickly introduce myself. I am Maristella Lucchini. I'm part of Nanit Lab, which is like the research branch of Nanit. Uh, I've joined almost two years ago. I have a background in sleep research and biomedical engineering. I love all the cool devices to measure sleep, uh, particularly during pregnancy and postpartum for the parents and then uh, for the little ones as well. And I also have three little ones myself. One is very little, two years old, but then I also have an almost seven and almost nine. So they're a little bit aging out. Um, uh, but anyway, so tonight we have a lot of fun topics to talk about. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and introduce um, uh, Sujay Kans Kansagra. And um, I will let you tell us a bit about you. Many people know you at the, as this, th that sleep doc, but I'm sure you have so much more to add. So take it away. <laughs> let us know a little bit about your background expertise and also yes. a little bit about you. Sure. Well, well thank you, Maristela, for having me. Thanks to the Nanit team. I'm really excited to talk to this group. Uh, so I'm Sujay Consagro. I am a child neurologist by training followed by training as a sleep medicine physician. Uh, I have been working at Duke and I'm currently a professor there and have been at Duke for about 12 years now. Uh, I have oh, two wow. little ones of my own, an eight and a 10 year old, two boys, and uh, live in Raleigh, North Carolina. And in my spare time, enjoy playing tennis uh, and, uh, and getting as much sleep as possible. <laughs> Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, okay, well, so I see a lot of other, oh, we have tween mamas. Ooh, fun stuff in here. But we're all going to have um, cool questions coming up in the Q&A later on. Um, so we have a lot of topics today. We're going to talk about sleep health for the parents, sleep health for the infants, sleep challenges. Uh, and we're going to try to leave 10 minutes at the end for Q&A. Feel free to put them in the chat and we're going to um, try to answer some during our um, discussion. Uh, and if we don't, uh, we're going to try to tackle them at the end. So let us know whatever questions you have. Um, so as I was trying to think what cool things we could talk about today, um, I dived in all the cool videos that you, you did recently. And there was one that really uh, sort of uh, stuck out and it was about sleep needs because I feel like there's just so much conversation about it we need seven hours we need eight hours and it can get just so confusing and also a little bit frustrating when you you feel like you know how much sleep you need but you can get it so I thought that before diving in all to the kids and infants um, conversation you can maybe tell us a little bit about what the data says about what is our sleep needs? And then maybe dive sure. into a little bit about how can we actually get that sleep that we need? Absolutely. So I would say sleep for parents and sleep for adults is incredibly important for many reasons. But typically when it comes to the range of normal sleep, we're talking seven to nine hours for the typical adult. And by seven to nine hours, I mean your sleep need will likely fall somewhere within that range. And I always make a point to emphasize the fact that just because we say seven to nine hours is average, there are people that fall outside of that range. And the thing to keep in mind is, is that everybody's sleep need is genetically determined and it's, you can't really change it. And so your sleep need will likely fall somewhere within that range. So if you are an eight and a half hour sleeper, for example, like I am, if you're sleeping seven every night, even though it falls within that range of quote unquote normal, you're still likely going to be chronically sleep deprived. <laughs> it's not going to work for you. And so I could not get by on seven hours every night because that's not my sleep need. We know that the younger you are, the more sleep that you need. And so we talk about infants and children, of course, needing a lot of sleep. And the reason for that is because the brain is developing very quickly and a lot of things are happening at that early age. And likely our brain needs more time to kind of rest and recuperate and continue to grow when we're really young. So um, seven to nine hours as an adult, much more when we're younger. And how, just, I'm just curious, like you were saying, oh, I'm an eight and a half hour. What were some things that you were noticing to say, oh, that's what I need? Uh, because I feel like that yes. could be helpful. Where do I fall in that range, right? Yeah, yeah. It, and it can be tricky to figure out, particularly if you're chronically sleep deprived, like so many people are in their adult years, especially if they have children. And so the goal here is I always say that if you are waking up fully refreshed in the morning, ideally before your alarm goes off, 
uh, and you're not needing too many substances during the day to keep you awake, like coffee, and you're able to maintain full alertness. Don't find yourself drifting off when things get boring and dull. Likely you're getting your complete sleep need. Now, if you have built on sleep debt, which is a very real thing, if you're chronically sleep deprived, you've built up a sleep debt that you then have to pay off, that can take longer. And so you have to adjust such that you're getting more than what you think your typical need is. And so I tell the, I tell the typical sleep deprived adult, let's shoot for at least nine, maybe nine and a half hours of in-bed sleep opportunity. And then over time, you'll naturally find that you're hopefully waking up a little bit earlier and earlier. And as that sleep timing shrinks, hopefully it'll stabilize somewhere. And that would be what your true sleep need is. Um, right. But the goal here is adequate quantity. And then, you know, we, we rarely talk about quality issues, but quality is also super important. So if you feel like you're getting what your sleep need should be, and yet you're still feeling fatigued and tired during the day, it could be a quality issue. And I'm, and I'm happy to jump into quality issues as well, depending on which direction we'd like to go. But there are so many quality issues that can come up when it comes to sleep. And I think that's definitely something that we want to explore, uh, particularly when we're going to talk about, you know, um, infants waking up at night and disrupting our sleep and how that can impact ourselves. But I, I was thinking about, because I see there's a lot of moms and dads joining, there's been a huge conversation about differences in need between um, the two genders. And the other thing that we could also maybe um, talk about is the timing, because I feel like that's also very different for some of us, right? Some of us, I could Absolutely. sleep seven hours, but if I go to bed very late, those seven hours will really not work great for me. And some people could be the exact opposite, right? Absolutely. Yeah, those are great topics to dive into. Yeah, so when it comes to gender differences in sleep, it has been an area that's been studied quite a lot. And studies show slightly different things. But on average, it appears that women uh, tend to need a little bit more sleep than men, at least based on data that we get from tracking devices. And so there was a study done with 69,000 adults all throughout the world, 70 plus countries, with about 11 million nights of data. And it showed so that- You're talking about like wearable devices. Wearable devices, yeah, which are usually pretty good cool. at determining sleep yeah. versus awake because it's all accelerometer based and that's exactly. pretty good at determining those two. And it found that women throughout, they're looking at um, teens all the way up to like 60s, 70s. And on average, women tended to sleep about 0.4 hours more than men. Now, the tricky part about this is that they also look to see how often you are waking up in the middle of the night. And women <laughs> at every age wake up more, more than men in the middle of the night. And there are likely many reasons for this, but particularly during the 20s and 30s, unfortunately, women are bearing the brunt of having more awakenings than men. And so we think that although they may have a slightly higher sleep need and might get a, to a higher total amount of sleep over a 24-hour period, their wow. sleep is likely much more fragmented. And we know that women are at higher risk of having insomnia and other issues that can affect sleep quality overall. Now, That's when it comes to sleep timing is also a great thing to talk about because all of us have an innate, what we call chronotype, which is, do we tend to be more of a morning bird or do we tend to be more of a night owl? And yeah. everybody kind of falls a little bit differently on that spectrum. It's dependent on our genetics. It's dependent on our age. When we're really young, when we're in our teens and early adulthood, we all tend to have a shift towards evening time and night owl tendencies. And then when we get much older in our golden years, our 70s and 80s, we tend to be morning birds. And that's why, you know, at the retirement center, supper is served at 4 p.m., right? <laughs> I mean, everyone tends to do things earlier. And so, um, but you can figure out what your natural chronotype is. They're actually, you might know just, you know, just based on your habits, what your chronotype is. But there's a fascinating survey you can take. It's called the Morningness Eveningness Questionnaire. You can Google it. It's readily available online. Yeah, it's really, it really fun. I think, yeah. Yeah. yeah, because you might notice, but I feel like that sort of makes you become more aware of some things that you kind of, if you don't know, you kind of like, you know, don't pick up on. But now we want to know what is your chronotype? We know that you need 8.5 hours sleep. What is your chronotype? <laughs> My chronotype, by, by nature, I tend to be more of a night owl. But as I've become a father and just living a life in medicine, things have shifted to more of an early, earlier time. So I do tend to, I do tend to turn in, you know, fairly early. I, I shoot like 9.30 to 10 uh, and then usually like around a 6 or 6.30 wake up time. So, um, so I think I've, I've shifted a little bit earlier just due to the yeah. kids. We definitely need to adjust a bit. And, you know, talking about that, so we have talked about a little bit about what we need and what should be our ideal goal. And I see now some parents that are chiming in and saying, my insomnia is so bad, I'm expecting, I can't sleep, or, um, you know, we know what we would need and sometimes it's a little hard. And I think we're going to try to talk later about how we can address our infant's needs. Are there some tips that you can give for adults to try to, you know, get that sleep that they need? 
Absolutely. So the, the, the key issues that come up for adults, particularly women that are pregnant. So restless leg can be a huge burden um, during, during the pregnancy years. Of course, there's natural discomfort when it, when, as, as the baby is growing, when it comes to sleep positions, et cetera. And then insomnia, as, as, as Viviana mentioned, insomnia is, is a very common problem amongst all adults and even you know, in, in our teenage population. Insomnia, the, the typical form of insomnia is characterized by excessive thinking and worrying in bed as opposed to resting and relaxing. And then the bedroom naturally becomes a place where you think and worry as opposed to a place where you relax. And the core therapy for classic insomnia is actually cognitive behavioral therapy. And the whole goal is essentially making your mind feel more relaxed and calm in bed as opposed to feeling revved up and worried. And I'm happy to actually walk through a couple of practical ways of actually implementing CBT, but the best way to do it is, of course, with the help of a, ideally a sleep psychologist or a sleep physician, a sleep professional that can help guide you through it. But here are just some core principles just to give you kind of a, a sense of you know, whether this is doable or not, because for most people, it's very doable, which in, um, includes sometimes sleep restriction. So if people that can't sleep naturally, sometimes they say, well, I'm going to lay here for 10 hours and hopefully I'll sleep six of it. And in fact, you want to do the opposite. You actually want to narrow down the amount of time you're giving in bed because you don't want to spend too much time awake laying there thinking and going Rolodexing through your thoughts. <laughs> um, you like to, you ideally want to get out of bed if you've been sitting, laying there too long without being able to fall asleep. So 20, 30 minutes, getting up, doing something boring, and then coming back only when you're sleepy with the same goal, linking your bed with the place where you actually feel calm and relaxed. I oftentimes recommend practicing something called paradoxical intent. Many people get caught up in trying to will sleep, right? It's like, why can't I just sleep? Why can't I just turn off that switch? And that actually increases their anxiety around trying to fall asleep. So I say, you know what? Instead of thinking about falling asleep, think about calmly laying there awake and being totally comfortable with being in the wake state. And sometimes that decreases anxiety just enough to paradoxically make you fall asleep instead of keeping you awake as you, what you're actually trying to do, trying to stay there quietly awake. And then I always emphasize for folks that do tend to be anxious at nighttime and have lots of thoughts, do a little bit of journaling during the day. Two or three minutes, bullet point list of things that are on your mind. Because in our fast-paced world, sometimes the only time we have to actually think about everything that's going on in our brain is when we're laying down in bed. And so I say, let's think about that stuff another time of the day. Get it outside, yeah. Day. Get it out, you know, and that can be helpful too. Those are just some of the techniques uh, of cognitive behavioral therapy. So I am, I'm looking in the chat and it's actually a topic that it's so interesting. And I, and I love how like I had my outline in mind, but then I'm trying also to keep an eye. There's so many cool topics that are coming out. And one of them is about what we call as professional bedtime procrastination. And yes. I think here what they, what this parent was describing is like, our son is sleeping great through the night, but we do so much as parents during the day that we just want to like have that time at the end of the year this leisure oh. time and so we just stay there watching tv keep scrolling even if we know we should go to bed and actually this yes. is something that we have a cool study coming up so uh, more results coming in the future about this right. but as a parent is something that i definitely see a lot and i don't know i'm gonna give an example from my experience as a parent my husband and i like we get to the end of the night our kids go to bed not to go to bed at eight it's great but then of course you want to you know entertain a bit and then I, I was realizing that after I was watching tv it was taking me so much time afterwards to wind down mm -hmm. and my uh, husband is a um, passionate crossword puzzle person <laughs> and so he got me into that uh, which actually I've realized that is something that helps me so much wind down because compared to tv so much more less stimulating and it helps yes. me with what you were saying of take my mind mind out of my train of thoughts and concentrate on something else that yeah. is Interesting enough, but not incredibly overstimulating. And so that's sure. something, just something that we do uh, to get a little bit of, you know, distraction, but at the same time, not get too completely uh, overexcited about stuff. But um, yes. this was just like a personal ex example, but I wanted totally. to know what you were thinking about, you know, tips to give that's, to parents. Yes, I, I love this topic. So, you know, the, the, the common term is revenge bedtime procrastination. Procrastination. You know, it's, yeah. it's not a medical term per se, but it's one that we've given to this concept. Real term. <laughs> I, I, I need to get some of that time back, right? I have given my time all day to my work, to my children, to, to you know, my, my, my spouse, et cetera. Uh, this is some time for myself and I'm going to take it out of my, my sleep time, you know, is essentially what happens because you're procrastinating your bedtime. And there are a couple of things that I, I, I say to this. One, my goal for you is for your children to be able to sleep at a time such that you actually naturally get 
multiple hours exactly. on your own, you know, yeah. because when your children are young and they're infants, they're toddlers, after they reach a certain age, hopefully they're going to bed at, you know, as early as 6.30, 7.30, which actually gives you some time to then be the adult, you know, and to have some time to yourself. And, and so, as you were so saying, one... it's not just to get time, but it's also because they need it. So like their that's need right. is aligned with that's your right. needs. So that's, that's absolutely. Thing. Absolutely. I, you know, sleep is like the magical win for everybody, right? I mean, you know, you, you, feel, you feel bad about putting your toddler maybe in front of like a screen for three hours while you have time to yourself, but you can feel great about them getting the sleep that they need while you get the time that you need. It's a win for everybody. And so that's why I love making sure that the whole family is sleeping, not, not just the kids. Uh, but what can you do? You know, what are, what are some things? So it's a, it's a mindset issue. So ideally, you know, you're going you're gonna to revolve your day around your sleep time and not the opposite. And I always say, you don't want to treat sleep as a luxury in an area that you can actually just cut down on to get extra hours because it makes you actually less productive the next day, less focused. And it just makes, it makes life drag on a little bit slower than it would otherwise. So you get into a cycle of just being an inefficient person if you're not getting the sleep that you need. Other thing I tell people is be a friend to your future self. You know, and so it's very easy to say, I'm going to sacrifice my sleep tonight. I'm like, but think about your future self. You know, you want to be their best friend. You want to set them up for success. And so you want to give them the rest that they need because tomorrow, you know, they're going to hate you <laughs> what you did yeah. tonight, you know? And so you got, to, you got to be a good friend to yourself. And also understand that there's no cheating sleep. You know, the best studies that we have show that you cannot get accustomed to sleeping less. Although subjectively, you may feel like you've gotten accustomed to it, if you do objective cognitive testing, your performance gets worse the longer you're sleep deprived. So just tell yourself, sleep is non-negotiable. You know, it really is important for you to and function at your best. It's so interesting that, you know, I was telling my husband at some point after all the three kids and all our schedules were completely, you know, a mess, especially mm -hmm. during the pandemic when we were taking shifts working. And then at some point I was like, it doesn't matter how much we need to work. We need to put sleep in our schedule because we were just yes. over scheduling everything. And then at totally. some point we were really starting to, as you were saying, you know, our performance on every level now work as parents, as spouse, like we were just completely deprived. I was like, that needs to enter in our schedule. It feels like it's so weird. We seem like sleep that just needs to happen. If it doesn't for whatever reason, because our lives are crazy and busy, we really need to put that in. And, and as you were saying before, I tried to figure out what is our sleep need, factor in a little bit, not too much, but a little extra time, just, you know, winding down everything and know that. And I actually now have a reminder on my phone so that, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes I'm tr I'm doing other stuff and I'm like, oh, okay. And occasionally it's fine. Like, you know, we have friends over for dinner. It's fine. There are times when, you know, you can, you can ignore that reminder, but as yes. long as that doesn't become a habit. Um, this, yeah. but this is why I love technology. You know, I, people talk about yeah. trackers and devices. It's great for actually bringing attention to your sleep, your sleep timing, your sleep need, and, you know, giving you gentle reminders when it's time for sleep. So that's, yeah. I, I love technology for that. And I think like I was thinking about some other cool studies that we've done recently and we have seen in our babies that the babies that sleep the best is those that have a consistent bedtime because that's also something else like that. And I think that works as well for us adults, right? The more Absolutely. the time where we go to bed kind of like shifts from night to night, the harder it is for our body to know now it's time to go to bed, right? And so I think that's as well the a reminder can be helpful to sort of uh, be consistent with uh, yes. with the timing. That's right. Our body loves a 24-hour pattern. You know, all living things on the planet essentially have a circadian rhythm. It's all part and parcel of evolving on a planet that has a 24-hour daylight cycle. And so when you keep your body in that 24-hour pattern, it becomes much easier to sleep, much easier to wake up at the right time. So it's good for, for all humans, babies, adults, everybody. So always keeping an eye on my um, lovely chat, I'm seeing some questions that are great bridges for our next section so we've talked a little bit about us adults but I think uh, a lot of parents their sleep is sort of driven or synced by the experiences of their children so we have some questions about sleep training if that's something that is necessary uh, some other people that are saying you know my kids wake up so many times a night I'm completely sleep deprived I haven't slept more than three hours in a row for the past month and so I think you know this is something uh, I would love to tackle this thinking about the infant stage and maybe uh, some more tips around yeah. the toddler stage. We have parents that are sort of um, across the entire spectrum. Uh, and so thinking about uh, the infant sleep, what are some of the tips that you have uh, for parents yeah. that are struggling and that uh, would like to have some advice? Let's do it. I, you know, I, I hope we have two hours here because I could talk forever. <laughs> 
Uh, so let me let me pack in let me pack in a bunch of practical things you can do uh, leading up to the whole sleep training conversation, and that's like a whole conversation of itself. So let's talk about the early the early times. Let's say zero to six weeks. Your baby just got here. If your child is otherwise healthy, born on time, the first six weeks end up being just a circus, right? I mean, it is a tough, tough time. And a part of it is because, you know, parents often say my child has their days and nights flipped. Well, it hurts. turns out yeah. children don't know what days and nights even are because they don't have that circadian rhythm. They're relying on mom's melatonin when they were in utero and now they're out, they're not making their own melatonin. So they are just waking and sleeping based on their hunger cues and really nothing else. So it is a tough six weeks. And you can ignore everything you see on social media, of people <laughs> backpacking through Europe when their child is three weeks of age. That's not reality. The reality is it is a circus. It can be overwhelming. It can be absolutely bonkers. There are a couple of things I recommend you do. One is go ahead and start getting the foundation for good sleep hygiene in place. By that, I mean, it's nice to have a certain time of the day where you go through your routine. Your baby is not going to give two poopy diapers, whether or not you're doing the routine <laughs> or not, but it's good for you as an adult to start getting into that routine and having some time of your day where you can say, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do it every single night. And it adds a little bit of order to the chaos. The second thing is if you are breastfeeding and, or if you want to, you should be highly encouraged to do so because breast milk also produces melatonin for the baby and actually can help line up their circadian timing. If you are pumping breast milk, it's not a bad idea if you ha if you can just label it whether you pumped in the a.m. or p.m. Now don't don't go crazy about this. I know you got a, tons of things on your <laughs> plate, but if you have that, if you can just quickly jot that down. If you're dating it anyway, just write down the time and try to feed that milk to your baby at the, around the same time because that can help maintain that circadian rhythm. Not a huge deal if you can't do it, but if you're doing it, that can help. And then the third important thing is this is a time where you you just got to accept help and ask for help. All right. And I, I tell mothers, if you are feeling excessively anxious, if you're feeling excessively sad, uh, depressed, there are resources for you. Your OB, your child's pediatrician are huge resources to make sure that you're getting the help that you need and the support that you need along the way, because it is a really, really challenging time. No, you know, there's, there's no way around that. All right. And so Jay, I was thinking, this is a good tip because there's a lot of expected matters. And I think that it's good. You know, many people sort of tell you, oh, it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. But I think a good advice is you can prepare before you can have some conversation with your partners and now you're going to get organized. You can reach out for help before with your family, because when you're in the middle of it, you're not going to have <laughs> the mental bandwidth to it's going to be so much harder. You can always ask for help, but the more you That's can prepare before the easier it will be once the baby will be here. Right. And so that's, that's, that's right. That's right. And I also say, please remain optimistic because those first six weeks can feel like six years and you're yeah. feeling like there's, there's nothing's going to change. And then magically at six weeks, two wonderful things happen. Your child starts shifting their sleep more so at night. There's still a lot of sleep in the day, of course, but it starts shifting more at night. And your baby typically around that age, you know, give or take a few weeks, begins smiling for the first time. And those two things can help carry you through the next phase, which let's yeah. talk about six weeks up That's to about true. four months. Yeah. You know, six weeks to four months is still typically too early to formally sleep train, but you can continue to work on those good sleep hygiene habits, getting your routine in place, et cetera. This is also the age where if you're able to, if your child has a drowsy period and you know you're coming upon time for bed, trying to put them down in their safe sleep space while they're drowsy so they can try to practice some of those self-settling techniques. Now, some babies don't have a drowsy period. My first <laughs> did not have a drowsy period. Went straight from wide awake to completely asleep and you know, had every sleep onset association in the book. That happens. But if your child has a drowsy period and you can read some of those cues and you're able to practice that, that might set you up for success and you may not ever, ever need to sleep train and they might just naturally start being a, a really great sleeper. Um, so six, six weeks to four months, good time to start practicing that. By the time your child hits four months of age, it's nice to shoot for about a two hour window if you can from the timing of last nap until bedtime, two hours or more. Now we talk about wake windows, but children's sleep timing is so variable that it's yeah. hard to truly lock in and say, this is gonna be the wake window your child is gonna have. But if you're looking at at least two hours, you're usually setting yourself up for helping your child build up that sleep drive and be particularly sleepy when it's bedtime and hopefully get a good few hours stretch in the first part of the night. So that's six weeks to four months. Those, those are the goals there. Um, and then we can talk about four months onward, because that's when you actually can implement a lot of the behavioral techniques. 
Should we jump into sleep training? I'm happy to give you my 10,000 foot view and then actually- Let's go. I think right there's a, some techniques. Let's do it. There's yes. a lot of parents that are really eager to learn more about that. <laughs> Absolutely. So let me start off with my party line, which is nobody has to sleep train. This is a parenting choice. There's nothing out there that says you have to, or you're destined to have a terrible sleeping baby if you don't sleep train. The data just does not show that. So every sleep professional you encounter, should nobody should say you have to do it. It is a parenting choice. It is a safe and effective option, but it's an option. So I always start there and say, if you don't want to, if it goes against what you want to do, don't need to do it. At the same time, I will tell you that the data overwhelmingly supports the safety and effic efficacy of behavioral approaches to helping sleep, aka sleep training. And so there are clear short and medium term benefits. When we look at five and six years out, the studies show that there's no benefit that continues. So everybody's sleep is kind of the same at that age, likely because there's so many other factors that play a role in your sleep once you're at that age, so far away from infancy. But clear short and medium term benefits when it comes to sleep continuity, when it comes to parents' impression of sleep, when it comes to maternal mood scores and maternal depression, great data to support that it helps moms with, with, their, with their mood scores, marital satisfaction, safety when it comes to driving, if your infant is sleeping well, all those things are, are better. So, so I say, don't be dissuaded because there's a lot of misinformation out there that says it's harmful, it's toxic to their brains, et cetera. There is no data to support that. There's no, and in fact, there's a lot of data to support a lot of the opposite of what people use to kind of you know, make people afraid against it. So there's actually data that shows that attachment actually improves with, with parent versus child, which makes sense. If everyone's sleeping better in the family, it's going to be much easier to have that attachment, that bond with your child. So, so just keep all that in mind. So that, that's, that's my, that's my starting Free spiel base. on sleep yep. training. All right. <laughs> <laughs> now sleep training, you know, it's, it's a, it's, there's no formal definition of what sleep training is, but in my mind, I consider it all of the behavioral strategies that we use to help teach a child self-soothing techniques such that when they wake up at night during normal awakenings, because every infant wakes up multiple times at night, they're going to be able to soothe themselves back to sleep without signaling for a parent to come help them get back to sleep because they possess that skill now. So sleep training is essentially teaching an infant that skill. Yes, it can be taught. There's many, many studies that show that children can learn this skill. There are, and, and a lot of opponents say, no, kids can't learn how to fall asleep. Well, there are many children that you never have to sleep train that have learned this skill. So clearly, it's a skill that children can learn very early. All right. The techniques are varied, but there are four key techniques. And I'll tell you, there's a trade-off. Usually there's faster response, but tends to be more, more crying up front versus slower response time, but less crying. And you want to cater it based on what a family is looking for. We talk about the extinction technique, which is the pure cried out technique, which has kind of fallen out of favor with most sleep professionals, actually. And, and parents don't like to use it. We don't like to use it. And so that's the, like the pure cried out. That's, that's one of four techniques for sleep training. My two go-tos are graduated extinction and camping out. These involve a little bit of a slower transition. The graduate extinction is the Ferber technique in which you go through your nighttime routine. You do all the fun things you enjoy doing with your infant. You put them down in their crib at the time that they are typically falling asleep. You don't want to get them in there too early, a time that they're typically falling asleep. And then you decide on a time in which you're going to step away from the crib, either sit on the opposite side of the room or leave the room, and then come back in and soothe your child for a minute. So that can be in five minutes, I'm going to come back, check on my child, soothe my child, for a minute, not take them out of the crib, and then leave again and wait for another specified period of time. That can be every five minutes. It can be five minutes, 10 minutes, and every 15 minutes after that. It can be every two minutes. The timing is totally arbitrary, but the goal is when the child goes from awake to sleep, they've done that without you being there helping them. That's the whole goal. And usually after three-ish nights, usually things start to improve, but night one, two, and three can be very hard. And then when a child wakes up in the middle of the night- It's a good thing yes. to know that it might not happen the first night that that's you're why. doing everything right and that shouldn't discourage yes. you because I feel like that, that's helpful to know because it will happen and it will feel hard. First few nights, that's right. Usually night two can be harder. They, they call it an extinction burst where a child is actually protesting a bit more. Night three can be tough, usually by night four. Some families say in one night, everything was great. And that's, that's fantastic. Usually by the end of the week, you should start seeing improvements in your ability, child's ability to fall asleep on their own and hopefully stay asleep. Now, people talk about feeding. What do I do about feeding? And I say, sleep training and night weaning are two completely different things. And so if your child is hungry at nighttime, please feed them. You know, we're not going to sleep train through hunger. You feed them if, they're, if, if, you, if, you, if you know they're hungry. Some children will wake up multiple times and, and mom knows 
not truly nursing. You know, they're they're not feeding, they're not emptying the breast. They're just soothing. And if that's the case, they don't need the feed. They just need to learn on the self soothing, work on the self soothing skills. So oftentimes, some of those awakenings for just soothing disappear, and then you know when they're awake, they're actually hungry, and then you feed them. All right. So that's graduated. Expansion. So I was just reading in the chat because I think some of the questions that are relevant yeah. for what you are trying to, so what you're explaining, yes. some parents are asking um, if these methods would be good to break the habits of falling asleep um, while in contact with the parent and relying on the pacifier. And I think this sort of all ties in. Absolutely. So I will tell you that in most situations, after a child is about four or five, six months of age, if a parent comes into my office and says, my child is waking up multiple times, but they're otherwise healthy. I can almost always say, well, I bet I know what's happening at the beginning of the night. I bet yes. you're having to help <laughs> them in some way get to sleep. You're, you're having to help them turn their brain off at the beginning of the night. Every, every human being can develop sleep associations, even adults. Either this is what we call sleep onset associations. The things that you associate with the process of falling asleep that your brain needs to help you go to sleep. So think of the adult that needs a TV on to fall asleep. That's a sleep association. They might find it harder to go to sleep without it. Same thing with the caregiver. If they've gotten accustomed to going to sleep on you or gotten accustomed to nursing to sleep, that is their crutch. That's what they're using to transition to sleep. And then when they wake up, again, during a normal awakening, they're going to look around and say, hey, where did that go? Like I was, <laughs> I was nursing to sleep and now I'm no longer nursing or I was being held. I'm no longer being held. They're not going to like it, right? And they're going to be angry about it and they're going to fuss and get your attention until you put that back in place. So the goal is to try to wean them off of things that are not going to be present in their safe sleep space when they wake up at night. Right. And I think I interrupted you before you were introducing the second option that you like. Oh, the, uh, yeah. The other one that I like is, is called the camping out technique. This is a much slower, kind of steadier approach. Oftentimes, children can have multiple sleep onset associations. And so I say a caregiver might be nursing and rocking and, and singing to their child. And I say, you know what, this week, let's maybe just nurse and rock. But let's get rid of the singing for a week and let get your child accustomed to that. And then after that, let's just nurse your child to sleep. But don't rock them. Just hold them there and let them fall asleep that way. Then after that, try to nurse them earlier in the routine. And then when it's time for bed, just hold them until they fall asleep. And then after that, after the nighttime routine is done, I'll put them in their crib and then just pat them to sleep in their crib. So what you're doing is you're slowly weaning your presence and your help for your child in a slow, gradual way. And the goal is that you do it gradually. You still are there to soothe them early on, but then once they're used to being in their, in their crib to fall asleep, you're kind of starting to distance yourself from that, you know, from the, and from the time they're actually going from wake to sleep, you know, you're trying to sit further away from the crib. It's a great technique for infants. It's actually also a great technique for toddlers, particularly toddlers that are anxious, that are, that are kind of pushing on the limits a little bit and having limit setting issues. This is also a technique that can be helpful for them. So that's camping out. There's a fourth technique for sleep training, which is called schedule awakening. This is one that I rarely ever use. I can count on one hand the number of times I've done it. It involves actually waking up your child in the middle of the night at scheduled times. That's why I hate doing it. And I don't recommend you do it unless you're working with a with a sleep professional. So we won't go into that one. <laughs> okay, great, great tips. Yeah. Um, and actually, you were um, just hinting to the next phase, which is toddlers. And this is something yes. that is so interesting to me. I have a two year old. Uh, we just potty trained, and uh, definitely he had some nights where he was trying to push boundaries and telling me he had to go to the bathroom to avoid going to bed, and all this fun yes. stuff that happened all of a sudden. Uh, he was sleeping great. And now, you know, there's just new developmental stages that they go through. And yes. I think as parents, it can be so frustrating because you're like, I've invested so much energy to make them sleep as they were babies. I thought I was done. And then all of a sudden, yeah. a lot of these things come up. Um, and so, yeah, do you have any tips, survival tips or general recommendations so, as things progress? So many tips. Gosh, so many tips. I'll tell you <laughs> that, you know, toddlers, toddlers are like little you know, they're little geniuses. I mean, they're, they're so smart, right? And they know exactly, you know, what they say and what to do to try to delay bedtime. Um, and they're also one... so cute. They're also so and cute. And they're so cute with the way they ask for one, one more hug, one more kiss, yeah. you know, it's, yeah, um, you <laughs> they're, 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 it's, it's tough. It's tough. So, um, so limit setting is, is a very common type of behavioral insomnia when you have the toddler years where they're trying to push. They're trying to push bedtime. They're making multiple requests, multiple curtain calls at nighttime to try to delay that bedtime. Now, the one important distinction I make is, is there any underlying anxiety for your toddler? And by underlying anxiety, sometimes it can be hard to distinguish um, anxiety um, from, from other issues. But you know, children that have lots of difficulty with separation during the day, I worry a little bit about anxiety. 
some children that get excessively irritable at nighttime, that can sometimes be hard to distinguish. You might think it's just behavioral, but actually could be more grounded in anxiety. So if your child has any concerns about anxiety and that's causing them to have difficulty with separating from you at night, the approaches are slower. And this approach I like to use is the camping out, which we just talked about for infants and sleep training, which is you, you get them comfortable and calm and build their confidence and their ability to fall asleep by being near them initially, and then slowly weaning your presence every few days to every week or so to, to distance yourself at the time of transition to sleep. Um, if a child is otherwise healthy, not anxious, et cetera, there are lots of other techniques that we'll sometimes use to help. And the one that has some data to su support is called positive routine, faded bedtime with response costs. It's a long, it's a long term, long name. but essentially <laughs> that means, yeah, it's a very long name, but, but the goal here is that you go through a great routine that you, that's enjoyable for your child. You temporarily push bedtime later than typical. And this is a process of fading where you push bedtime later in hopes that after routine, they fall asleep relatively quickly. If they protest and sleep is not coming, you remove them from bed. You go through a mini routine again until you know that they're really sleepy. And then you try again and you get them into bed. And then over time, once they're quickly falling asleep after the routine and able to go to sleep, then you start moving bedtime earlier and earlier and earlier to your desired goal. And, and the goal is to move it slowly. We're talking you know, like 10 minutes, 15 minutes a day until you get back to your goal. Um, this technique, you know, the goal here is instead of behavior modifications, essentially pairing the sequence of events in the routine with then getting into bed and, and going to sleep. Um, and so we're trying to, we're shooting for that association of the bed being a place they relax and everything is calm and they know they're comfortable. Uh, so that's one technique. The other one that I'll sometimes use is called a silent return to bed or the robotic return to bed in which after you do all the fun stuff with your routine and you've, you've, put, them in, you've put them down and it's time to leave, you tell, you tell the baby, all right, all right, baby, Billy, um, I've, got, I've got to step out. Uh, it's time for bed and you leave the room. And then Billy does not like that. Billy walks right after you and says, <laughs> no, no, I need a glass of water. I need this. And I tell families at that point, the, core, the key to behavioral modification is being 100% consistent and 100% persistent in your approach. You have to outlast the persistence of a toddler, which is very hard to do. But then you tell Billy one boring line and you bring Billy right back to bed. So you say, Billy, it's time for bed. We love you. See you in the morning. And you place him right back in bed. Billy doesn't like this. He's going to run right back after you. And then you do the exact same thing. There's no emotion. There's no begging. There's no pleading. There's no, it's just a matter of fact of uh, I'm a robot and I got to put you back is. into bed yeah. every time I leave. That's right. So, um, and that is the core to behavior modification really at any age, which is the consistency and persistence in your approach. Uh, my toddler, I had to bring him back to bed when 213 times one night, you know, <laughs> like I, I, t I tell families, you know, it's toddlers are persistent little, little beings, oh, yeah. you know, they're, that's how they get what they want. They're super yeah. persistent. So you have to meet their persistence and outlast it. I love to combine it with positive reinforcement. So particularly for children, when they're three and above, even some kids younger than three working for rewards. So having that sticker chart on the door and say, Hey, if we earn three stickers this week where you, you know, go to sleep nicely and you wake up and, you know, everybody's happy, we'll put those stickers up together and we can earn a nice, you know, non-food, small reward uh, at, the, at the end of the week. So give them and let them buy into it. What do you, what do you want for a reward? Let's work together for that common goal. And that, that can be are always, always a uh, crowd pleaser. So uh, that's all awesome. And I think we have two, two questions that I think are super interesting. One is related to how can we implement these things? If we're traveling, which happens so mm -hmm. often, are there some key yes. advice that you would give? Um, and the other thing is also um, if we're sharing a room, like, uh, oh, yes. because I feel like, you know, we are data driven. We love of these things. And uh, I live in New York. I have a tiny apartment. I've spent my last 12, the last 12 years of my life diving into the data and I knew all the right answers. And then I had to have my kids, all three kids share one room. And then I was mm -hmm. like, well, now, how are we going? <laughs> Not all the scenarios yes. are into the data that we, yes. <laughs> that we study, and you have to, you know, uh, be like knowledgeable and flexible at the same time, right? So, uh, totally, what are totally. some tips that you have for these scenarios? Yeah, it's, the right answers, but we need to be flexible. Yeah, see, I will just tell you, Mr. Stella, I will tell you that as a sleep doctor, you know, I used to give lectures to, you know, to pediatricians about all these great sleep training techniques, and everybody always asked, like, do you have kids? And I was like, no, not yet, you know. <laughs> And then, yeah, I mean, I had kids and they, they dropped, kicked me in the face, you know, like they, I was like, I had to relearn, you know, what, what I thought was right. And, and thankfully, like the techniques I learned did help, but it was much harder than I thought it was going to be, even for the pediatric sleep doc. So, so reassurance to everybody out there, you know, sleep is tough, even for the sleep doc that specializes in children. 
children, you know, uh, it, it can be even for the researcher that's in all the stuff regarding sleep, it, it can be a challenge, you know, that's just the nature of nature of sleep. All right. So what do you do if you're traveling? If you're not switching time zones, because time zone travel is a completely a whole different, different thing. If you're not have another event on that. That's right. If, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. If you're not switching time zones, the goal is to take a little bit of, of home with you. So whatever you can take that keeps the routine in place is ideal. And so if it's a sound machine they're familiar with, if it's a pillow or a blanket that they're familiar with, if it's a book you like to read before, take a mini routine with you and try to implement that as best as possible. Most places that you stay, if it's hotels, will have nice blackout curtains, et cetera. So you can ideally make the room you know, as conducive to sleep as possible, but just know that it's going to be a challenge, you know, when you, when you travel and plan for it. I say, you know, build in time for, for downtime. Your child, if they're three or four, they just outgrew a nap. Think about putting that nap back in place just during the travel period because everyone's going to be sleep deprived and tired. But the core goal here is take a little bit of home with you whenever you can. Um, if you are sharing a room, I'll tell you that if you're trying to implement some of the behavioral techniques to help with sleep, it's nearly impossible to do it for two children at the same time, all right? Because they're just gonna feed off of one another, et cetera. So my goal here is if you have one child that's sleeping well and one child that you wanna start implementing the behavioral challenges, try to do that separately, at least for a short period of time. So take the good sleeper, maybe put them you know, in, in a different, different room or even in your room in the corner for just temporary, you know, um, and, and, and then focus on the other child. And once they're sleeping well, then introduce the good sleeper again but it's almost impossible to tackle two toddlers at the same time that are both experiencing sleep challenges. You got to have to, you got to divide and conquer, unfortunately. So, yeah. and then one will wake the other one up. Even if one is a good sleeper in that room, they might wake that one up and it turns into a disaster. Yeah, that that's, uh, that's definitely a challenge. Um, so, I mean, we are both super data, data geeks. Can I, I mean, I can say that about me. I feel like we share totally. some passion about that. Yes. <laughs> um, so how, how do you, you like some of the new technologies can help us. I think before you were talking about the huge study with wearables, what are some things that parents can be on the lookout and that can be really informative for them? Like we really want them to feel more confident and use these tools in a way, not provoking anxiety, yes. but actually making them feel more confident. Totally, totally. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, I have a bias because, you know, when, when it comes to adult, uh, adult trackers and, and wearables, you know, I feel like they are less useful than some of the things that, for example, you all work on for, for younger children, because we naturally have this, we naturally want to track patterns for our children. And that feedback can be very helpful in ensuring that our, our children are developing the way we want them to. So, so having trackers like the cameras that will tell you when your child is awake, when your child, you know, the, the patterns can be very helpful data information that you don't need to sit there and write down every single night. For adults, the main role for trackers is to one, bring awareness to your sleep, and it's good for helping you decide how many hours of sleep you've gotten. That's what the trackers are actually good for. The technology is getting better, but right now it's not very good at telling you what light and deep stages of sleep are. You know, they, they, all these trackers love telling you, okay, this is your deep sleep, this is your light sleep. That's actually not even how we divide it when it comes to our sleep study metrics. You know, We're looking at you know, what is REM sleep? Do they consider that light sleep or deep sleep? Because based on EEG, it's actually very really light sleep. Um, but people might consider that deep sleep because you're not really moving very much. So your tracker might think you're in deep sleep. So, you know, use all that that's with a grain of salt. Tricky. Any numbers, yeah. that's right. Any numbers they spit out at you to tell you how you should be feeling. You know, I, I tell folks you have a great, you have a great device that can help tell you how you're feeling, which is your own brain. So before you rely on a number that the device has given you to tell you how you feel, just ask yourself that question. Like, how do I feel this morning? <laughs> do I feel like I got a good night of sleep? trust that more than you trust any sort of device or tracker. Yeah, I think that's such an interesting point because otherwise we feel like we can uh, take those useful metric and then sort of obsess over it and then takes us in not the right place where we want to go. Can, and, uh, you know, I mean, can I nerd out a little bit on that, which is we have data now that shows that people develop what we coined orthosomnia, which is yes. insomnia or anxiety around bed because they're super fixated on the numbers that and, 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 and fixated on getting that number perfect. And it paradoxically worse than sleep. So, you know, you, you got to have a, a healthy relationship with these devices. That's so interesting. And I think like, you know, Nan, at Nani, we're super proud that we really did a lot of work to make sure that all the metrics we give to our parents are at the level of 
most of the studies that you would do with, you know, actigraphy, which is the, uh, one yes. of the devices that are used in Zip Clinic. So we really want to make sure that what we give them is something that they can rely upon. Totally. Introducing totally. more metrics around developmental milestones and position yes. to, to, you know, give this data at your fingertips. You have already so many things in your mind uh, that... Yeah. That you don't have to worry about some of these it's other pretty, things. It's pretty. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, I just I realized you you have specialized sheets that could track growth, like how long, yeah. how, how tall your baby. Uh, yeah, I Nanit was. I'm aging myself, but Nanit was not around <laughs> when I had kids. You guys had not launched yet, but some of this information is just absolutely fascinating and, and, yeah. and pretty amazing. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, there's just um, so much going on in the chat. I'm trying to keep an eye, but I had one quick question that I wanted to ask, and then we'll see if we have time to tackle some of the other questions that are coming out. One question is, when do you think, like, what are some of the signs that you feel like parents should be aware that it's time to talk to a sleep specialist? Because I feel like sometimes yeah, it's yeah. hard to say, I'm fine, we're going to age out of this. And you were you were talking a little bit yes. about this before. And some of, but what are some key red flags? You're like, well, if this happens, you need to talk to someone. And this is the time when you yes. need to talk to this. Yeah, I, I, will, I will preface this by saying part of the issue is access. You know, I, I wish there were more pediatric sleep focused uh, you know, professionals out there. And a lot of times parents are left with searching the internet and relying on, you know, social media, which can just put you in so many different directions, you know. I would say that uh, a couple of main areas to focus on. If your child, your older child is snoring and has some sign or symptom of sleep apnea, which can include uh, attention difficulties, behavioral challenges, um, feeling really irritable, impulsive, uh, uh, challenges with weight gain, uh, excessive weight, large tonsil size, like all of these can be additional signs or symptoms that your child could have sleep apnea. So I say if they snore, plus one more thing you know, that makes you concerned, it definitely goes to talk to your pediatrician. And sometimes you also have to convince your pediatrician because we don't get a lot of training on this as pedi pediatricians, unfortunately. You have to tell them, I really think my child needs a sleep study. And, and, and I hope that you have access to either a pediatrician or a sleep lab that can cater to, a, to your child. But sleep app is something you definitely want to screen for because that can affect uh, long -term, have long-term consequences regarding their overall trajectory with academics, et cetera. Um, when it comes to insomnia or difficulty sleeping, I will say that if it's a problem for you and if it's a problem for the family, it's worth bringing up to your pediatrician and hoping that your pediatrician can provide some guidance. Uh, I, I also have a really a soft spot because I'm a pediatrician by trade, right? That's where I got my foundation training as pediatrics, then child neurology, then in sleep. They have like 20 minutes to, to dive into everything related to child's health, uh, vaccination yeah. <laughs> and firearm safety and, you know, uh, eating and behavior. And I, I'm like, my gosh, like, how are you going to attack sleep? It takes me an hour to do my typical insomnia consults. It takes me longer than I did for my intractable epilepsy consults because there's so many things to ask about regarding cultural dynamics and social dynamics, child's habits, parent preferences, et cetera. So um, so I do have a soft spot for pediatricians, but talk to them. They can be great resources. Um, but if it's a problem for you, it's worth thinking up to a pediatrician. That's that's kind of my my bottom line. I think um, these are very helpful tips. I was just speaking yesterday with a mom. She had three kids and she was at her third kid. And she was like, I think it was the same for the other two. But now I just cannot take it anymore. Maybe I'm just like becoming old. And I'm like, no, if it doesn't work for you now, that's something that is worth, you know, talking and asking totally. about like if it doesn't work that that means that you, you need to ask for help and we shouldn't That's you know right. justify ourselves and trying to you know uh pull ourselves by out um without you know contacting the proper resources so um Absolutely. i think this is super interesting and uh well i'm trying to there's just so much uh interesting um questions so we really have just a couple of minutes but uh, I think one uh, interesting question that happens so often, uh, one parent is saying that they have a dinner tomorrow night, and so they might need to tweak a little bit their usual routine, and they're like, I have a great sleeper, I'm so worried that, you know, changing yeah. the routine might mess it all up. <laughs> uh, uh, what are some tips, apart from being, you know, uh, patient with yourself, <laughs> with your child? Yeah, I, I will say that, you know, there has to be a healthy balance here. Even as a sleep physician, I tend to be somewhat lenient and say, you know, you, you, got, you got to live your life sometimes and it's okay. You know, <laughs> the kids, the kids will figure it out. You know, and again, this is coming from a pediatric sleep doc. 
you know, it's okay to also go out there and, and, and live. And sometimes you, you're going to, you're going to sacrifice a little bit of sleep. Uh, that's, that's your, that's your choice as a parent. You know, you can do that again, just know that it might be a rough couple of days afterwards. So you have to decide what's benefit for yourself, It's a um, balance. but you, but you get to make that call as a parent. And so you should not feel bad if as a parent, you're like, Nope, I'm going to stick with bedtime at seven o'clock. Like we were pretty, we were probably a little bit more strict than we needed to be with my, with my first one. Like we would leave parties and say, I don't, we're going home because we didn't want to deal with the aftermath of sleep deprivation. That was, that was our choice as a parent. And as we got a little bit older, the kids got a little bit older, we became more lenient over time. You get wow. to decide and nobody can tell you whether to feel bad about your, your decision. That's your decision to make, you know, yeah. and, and you know, mother yeah. should not tell you, you know, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's your choice. And if you want to be super strict about it, that's totally Go fine. And I think before you, you, you were mentioning, right. it have, this has repercussions, like good sleep has repercussions on so many levels. I feel like so often we don't even realize you were mentioning uh, the study about driving or like yes. marital satisfaction. We had one study that we put out last year about um, the sex life of parents and how much, you know, uh, it can be impacted by the... Their, I saw uh, that study. Sleep. Yeah. Yeah, that was cool, right? <laughs> That's really cool. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, uh, many, many, th many things can certainly be affected the next day. And interestingly, you know, the study on driving, you know, uh, it was it was on mothers. And it was like, you know, the, if they report a sleep challenge to their infant, they were sleeping on average like 6.2 hours a night. Women that had infants that were sleeping well were sleeping on average about eight hours per night. Wow. And, and controls, which was women that did not have any children, were sleeping about 7.9 hours per night. And so clearly, women that had infants that were sleeping well were sleeping about more. And then the sleep-deprived moms we're more likely to speed in a driving simulator and more likely to swerve in the road and not stay in the middle of the lane. So, so mom's sleep, parent's sleep is incredibly important for everybody's sleep. And so one of my other, my points here is, you know, regardless of what you decide to do regarding sleep training, et cetera, if you're getting the sleep that you need, that should not make you feel guilty because your sleep as a primary caregiver is incredibly tied into the well-being of your child. And so you should parent, no parent should ever feel guilty about trying to get their sleep because at the end of the day, it's still for their child. And if their child is sleeping well, that's good for them. If the child is sleeping well, that's good for mom. If mom's sleeping well, that's good for mom. If mom's sleeping well, it's good for baby. And if dad's sleeping well, it's good for, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I talk about mom a lot because unfortunately moms bear the brunt of this. But what I'm saying is that everyone's sleep is tied in together and it's good for everybody if you're getting the rest that you need. 100%, I am a big believer. And I'm so glad that we were able to tackle um, leap across the whole age uh, no spectrum from really like day zero to toddler years. Uh, we were able to talk about parent sleep and how it, all thing, these things tie together uh, because as you're saying, like we're all, we're a big ecosystem and um, you can separate those things. And I love yes. the shout out to say um, prioritizing your sleep really makes you a, a better parent. And I, uh, and I think that's something that we really, it, it can be like a, a, a summary of our conversation. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I think we're really approaching as i said when we were just joining these hours are gonna fly and i feel like it has it has been so fast for me uh and as we are closing here um i really want to thank you all of you for joining i know that as parents it's so hard to you know find one hour to tune in and listen and have the attention span to dedicate uh and also i want to thank you sujay you really have shared so much knowledge and helpful tips and uh I'm really, really, truly um, grateful for this. Um, I think um, we have a couple of other events that are coming up next week. One is about fertility and IVF. Uh, and then we have another one about AI and technology in parenting. Um, so you can check out our community website and uh, RSVP if this is interesting. But again, thank you everyone for joining. Thank you, Sujay. Thank you so much. And hopefully uh, have a great night's sleep, all of you guys. <laughs> yes, sleep well, everyone. <laughs> bye, bye, bye. Bye.